My name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for being with us this morning on this holiday weekend. Thank you for being here. Whether you're watching online because you're traveling or you're here in the room, I'm glad that you decided to be with us today. I don't know if you've ever been to a mirror maze or not. I've been to one. We have one here in Myrtle Beach. And a few years ago, I took my son there and uh, thought that would be fun. And it was. A mirror maze is interesting because it can be very disorienting, right? You don't know what's a wall and uh, what's a room and what's a door. It all just kind of blends together in, a, in like a whole vast room of reflections, right? And you're probably thinking, why would I want to have that many mirrors around me? I barely like looking in the mirror in the morning. Like, I understand that if that's you. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. And my favorite moment, I think, was when my son was so sure that he was going to run down a hallway and went smack right into the glass, like in the mirror. It was really funny. I have it on video. I should have shared it. But I didn't. So that's good for me. Um, also, I, maybe you've been to like a fun house mirror kind of thing, you know, where you go down and uh, there's different curves in the glass, different angles in the mirrors, and they make your body uh, image like a stretch or it squashes and it's all kind of disorienting and jarring a little bit and it takes your image and you kind of see yourself kind of go big and small and all of that. Uh, uh, one of my favorite shows is Seinfeld. I don't know if you've ever seen that. You don't have to. It doesn't matter. But there's an episode where Elaine goes to a store to buy a dress. And then she, like, tries it on in the store. And then she goes home and tries it on. And she realizes it does not fit well. And she accuses the store of skinny mirrors. Now... That came out in the 90s. Fast forward to like, I think it was 2015, there was an episode of Shark Tank where someone had a product that was literally called Skinny Mirror. And she like wanted to sell it to retailers and that was like her main customers and have people buy this because the angle of the mirror was ever so slight that it would make you look thinner and that would help with like your self-perception, right? Like, oh, I look thinner, I look good. And no shark invested in it because they were like, this is deceitful. Like you are lying to people and making them think they look good when they do not. Much like husbands do to their wives sometimes, you understand. Like, no, we always tell the truth. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I stepped, I shouldn't have gone there. All right, moving on. But the thing is, is like the truth of it is, is that how we perceive ourselves often determines our behavior. In that in that skinny mirror scenario, the perception is, okay, I look good in this, therefore. I'm going to buy it. And they've tried this in other things as well. There was a research done a few years ago where they took a, a uh, classroom of students, of elementary age kids, and they would tell them, oh, you guys are doing great. You guys are all doing so well. And they created, they just told them that they were doing really well, that they were being really good students, that everything was working out. They didn't show them their grades. They didn't show them. They didn't measure it that way. They just kept telling them, you guys are doing great. And then they had just the regular class that they didn't give that kind of feedback to. And those that perceived themselves to be doing really well did improve all of their scores. Why? Because their self-perception was, oh, we're really smart, we're really good. And so it changed their behavior that they were really smart. And they started picking up on things faster. So our perception of how we perceive ourselves does in fact like change our behavior. As followers of Jesus, we're going to take a look today at what it means for how we perceive ourselves. What does that do to our behavior and how we live our lives. Because sometimes, like a funhouse mirror, we can be looking in a mirror and maybe we perceive ourselves to be a certain way that we actually are not. And sometimes we might have a wrong understanding of who God is. And, and sometimes it's both of those things together. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at some ideas of um, of what it means to follow Jesus. And maybe some things that over time as we're following Jesus we forget. Maybe some things that were never taught to us to begin with. And so Pastor Terry started this series off by talking to us about our mindset. How can we live a life following Jesus with joy? We looked at what it means to do life together in community with one another. We took a look at baptism. Like what does that mean and why is that so important as we follow Jesus, what does that mean? What does that signal for others? And many of you have said, yeah, I need to do that. And so in a few weeks, we're going to head down to the beach and we're going to do that there. And if that's you, like you can still join in with us for that. 
Last week we took a look at what it means for us to serve the body as the church, to come together to serve one another, not only for the benefit of the body, but so that together we can also have an impact in the world around us. Today we're going to take a look at something that Jesus taught that I think is going to be like holding up a mirror to us. Now, a funhouse mirror has curves in it, and it, it kind of stretches or squashes, but a real true reflection comes with a flat mirror. And so Jesus is going to hold up a flat mirror today, which I hope is, is going to show us who we are, and also show us who he is. And the beauty of this is that there is something there for every single one of us in this room. Jesus was accustomed to teaching to large crowds of people, made up of a very diverse kind of crowd. And when he does this, he, he makes a point. He's a master at telling stories, a master at giving principles and guiding people towards relationship with him, towards relationship with God. And he holds up a mirror every time that is a true reflection of who God is and of who we are. And today is no different. We're going to take a look at a chapter in Luke. Luke is a gospel written that tells us what Jesus did when he was here with us on earth, how he led his followers and all the things that he taught. And we're going to take a look at Luke chapter 15. And here we go. We'll start at the top. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now just to give you a glimpse of the crowd that day, Luke makes a point to tell us there are several different groups of people here in this crowd. We have sinners. These are people who really, eh, maybe they understand a little bit about God. They've, they've heard about having a relationship. But honestly, they got their own thing going on. And they are sinners. And then we have tax collectors. And these tax collectors are worse than the sinners. The tax collectors are ones who basically are working for the Roman government. The, the government that is occupying them. And they are taking from God's people. They are taking what is God's people's, their money, their resources. They are lining their own pockets. And they are also not just helping themselves out. They're giving it to the occupiers as well. So they are like the worst of the worst. And then we also have Pharisees and teachers of the law. These are the people who are the gatekeepers of what is holy. They are the ones who determine what is right and what is wrong based on their interpretation of the law. And so these groups of people are all here together listening to Jesus. The sinners know that they are sinners because the gatekeepers have told them they are. Right? Like you understand like these people are in this crowd. The tax collectors are in this crowd. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law are in this crowd. And they're all there together. And I just have to imagine that this group of people, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the gatekeepers of what is right and wrong, they notice that the sinners and the tax collectors are here. And I imagine that they are rolling their eyes. Or they're thinking, what are they doing here? Like, who told them they could be here? Like, the, come on, really? These guys? Now, usually when I read this, I'm very quick to just be like, oh, those silly Pharisees and teachers of the law, meh. I just kind of write them off and be like, they're being silly. Why would they think? But then I had to think about it differently because I really want to understand that. So I thought about it a little differently, and I was thinking, maybe there's people in my life that if they showed up to a gathering like this, I might roll my eyes. I might be like, why is that person here? Have you ever felt that way about somebody? Like you're like, man, I love going to church. But if that person showed up, I'd be like, why are they here? Like I, I, I'm glad they're here, but it's not going to do anything for them. You know what I mean? Like I didn't invite them. I'm going to stay over here. Glad they're here, but we know that this is just for show. Or this is just lost words on them. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're like, no, that's not me at all. Just go with me for a second. If we were to just scale that back, who would you put in the blank? Now, the blank and the blank, we're all gathering to hear Jesus. Who is it that you're like, man, if they showed up, I would roll my eyes. It could be people of a different political persuasion than you. It could be uh, people that you work with. 
Somebody that wronged you at some point. It could be people of a different economic class or race even. Could be even somebody from a different country or group of people. And if they showed up to hear Jesus, you'd be like, man, I'm glad they're here. But honestly, eh, it's not going to do much for them. You might have that person in your mind right now. You can fill in the blank. Or maybe you are the person and you feel like people are rolling their eyes at you. You see, Jesus is about to hold up a mirror to everybody to give an honest and true reflection of who they are and who God is. And regardless of where you're at, the best thing about this is that Jesus is speaking and everyone is going to listen. So he starts telling some stories because he was a great storyteller. He tells three stories, a little trilogy of sorts. The first story is about a coin that gets lost And a woman turns up her whole house trying to find it. And she finds it and she says, guys, I found the coin. Let's have a party. And then another story is about a sheep who gets lost. And the shepherd leaves 99 sheep who are not lost to go after the one who is lost. And he finds the sheep and he calls all the other shepherds. And he says, guys, I found the lost sheep. Let's celebrate. And God's, I mean, Jesus says, hey, here's the point of that. When something is lost and is found, that's cause for celebration. And God rejoices when someone is lost and then is found. That is a mirror of who God is. And then he tells a third story. And in the third story, he holds up a mirror not only showing us what God is like, but showing us who we are as well. So here's the third story. In Luke chapter 15, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. The property division there would be basically about two-thirds going to the older brother and about one-third going to the younger brother. They were entitled to this inheritance. It was going to be given to them. It was rightfully theirs. But the younger one says, hey, I don't want to wait for you to die. Can I just go ahead and have it now? And the, old, and the father is like, okay, I mean... He doesn't even say, hey, rethink this. He doesn't say anything. He's like, okay, sure. I'm a generous dad. I'm going to give it to you. And so he does. And then the story continues. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, including the inheritance that he was just given, right, everything. And he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went, and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, This story is incredible. We have a son who is taking his inheritance. And you understand he could have just received his inheritance and stayed home. But instead he takes his inheritance. And after a little bit he's like, you know what, I'm going to get out of here. I'm good. I don't need to stay home anymore. Thanks. I'm going to take all of this. And he leaves. Not just down the street. Not just across town. He goes to a far off, distant country. He wants to be very far away from his father, from his family, from all of that. And so he starts going. And he gets to a place where he doesn't know anyone, but he's got money, right? And so he starts spending. He starts living his life, doing what he wants. And it's great until it isn't. Because famine comes, a crisis comes. And in that moment, he has spent everything and he has nothing to show for it. Nothing of value. Worse than that, not only does he have nothing, he has no one. There is no one who is like, hey, I'll take you in. Hey, I'll help you out. He is alone in a far off country. And he has nothing and no one. So he tries to get a job. And the only job he can get. And believe me, I guarantee you, the people listening to the story would know He would take any job he could get except the one that he gets, which is to feed pigs. 
Because if you were Jewish and you were feeding pigs, pigs being the unclean animal, you should have nothing to do with them. And now you're taking care of them and you're feeding them. That is like the lowest of the low that you could get. What a horrible place to be in. And he's so hungry, he's just hoping that he would get something to eat. In fact, he's watching the pigs eat what he's feeding them. And he's hoping, guys, don't overfill your stomachs. Leave a little, you know, if you want. I could eat it. That's how hungry he is. Now, at this point, when Jesus says no one would give him anything, in the crowd, and Jesus telling it, it's not written there, but I like to imagine that there's a really long pause after Jesus says that. When Jesus says no one would give him anything, I imagine that he hesitates before he continues because this group of people over here, when Jesus says no one would give him anything, they're thinking, oh, this is a great story. I love this story. Good. Good, Jesus. Maybe they'll finally get it. Because those guys over there, those sinners, those tax collectors... They have been wandering, doing their own thing for so long. Maybe they'll finally wake up and realize that no one is going to give them anything if they continue living the way that they are living. Good, Jesus. We agree with you in that. This is an excellent story. And I imagine that the tax collectors and sinners who are listening to the story, they hear no one would give them anything, and they're like, well, yeah, we know. No one gives us anything. Those guys don't. They give us nothing. We know what our life is like. We, we know we're sinners and tax collectors. They've told us that we are. We know that we're the lowest of the low. In fact, these religious guys have told the ca- tax collectors before. They are basically like that kid feeding pigs because they are literally taking what is the inheritance of God's people and they are literally giving it to pigs, to the Roman occupiers. That is exactly where they are and we should not give them anything. They should be cut off. So in that pause, they're very happy that these guys are learning something and these guys are thinking, wow, we thought maybe Jesus was different. We had heard different things about him. But instead, it's just the same guilt and it's the same shame and it's the same weight that they've been telling us. So let's go. And in that long pause, I imagine that this group is like, let's maybe get out of here. They're getting a little uncomfortable. They're thinking we should leave. And these guys are watching them. And they're like, good, good. But Jesus doesn't let the pause linger too long because then he continues the story. And Jesus says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I'll go back to my father and I'll say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So make me like one of your hired servants. Wait a second. The story was supposed to end at no one would give him anything. That's how it should end because do you know what sinners and tax collectors do? They have basically removed themselves from God's people. They should have nothing. So when Jesus says, hey, he gets, comes to his senses, he'll go back as a hired servant. Maybe they then think, okay, well, wait a second. Well, yes, I mean, yes, God, God is loving. And, and the father was been so generous already to give him something, right? The father was very generous already. And so, yes, if the father was going to be extra generous, he would take him back as a servant, right? Yes, he could come back and he could make some restitution. He could come back and he could earn his place as a servant. He could come back and he could pay his father back for the way that he lived, for all that he wasted. Okay, Jesus, I can get there. That's good. And these guys are probably thinking, all right, so the son can go back and be a servant. He has to earn his way back. Oh, we've heard that story. Those guys have told us that story. Here's the thing about that story is that the way to pay it back, they keep changing the rules on it. They keep saying we have to do this. There's this ritual. There's this sacrifice. They keep saying, oh, you messed up this. You did that. All these things. 
So yeah, we get it, Jesus. We could go back. We, we could be a servant. But the truth is they're going to keep moving the target and we're never going to get there. They know that. So it's not really worth it, right? Good story. We'll sit it out. But Jesus doesn't stop the story there either. In fact, he continues. And this next part is my favorite part, and I hope that it's your favorite part. And you write it down, you print it out, you put it somewhere handy. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. I love that phrase, full of compassion. It literally means that the father was full of suffering with his son. It means that from the moment that the son left home, his father was constantly thinking about him, wondering how he was doing, worried about him, wishing he would just turn around and come back. That the whole time that the son was off in a distant country, the father was thinking, man, I hope he's okay. I know what that place is like. It is dangerous. I wish he wouldn't have gone there. God, will you please bless him with something? I hope that there's people there that will take care of him. I hope that he finds his way. And then the son wastes everything and famine strikes the land and the father suffering with his son is probably like, man, I hope that he's okay. I hope he has enough resources. I hope that everything is all right. I hope he finds a place. I hope that doesn't affect him too much. And if it does, would he just come home? And he hears that and he thinks that. And every day he's hoping, waiting that he'll come back. And sure enough, the son shows up one day and the father just takes off running towards him. And these guys, when they hear that in the story, they're like, wait a second. No, 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 no. I don't know about that. He's got to earn it still. And these guys are thinking, well, wait, wait, wait. Okay, what's next though? Then the dad's going to make him like do a bunch of work and it's never going to work out, right? Like that's how it's going to go, Jesus, right? And this is what Jesus said. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And just when he's about to say, so make me like one of your servants, the father says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Because when something is lost, it's found. You celebrate. And Jesus was very adamant to point out that the father said, this son of mine, that, imagine, be hearing that. If you're these guys, well, wait a second, wait, 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 wait. What about the servant part? What about the part where he has to go back and earn it? What about the part where he has to make restitution? What about all the rich, what about that he has to... Work so many years in the field and work so many years in the house. What about all of that? You're saying that this is wiped, is gone. He doesn't have to do any of that. He's just accepted as a son. And these guys are thinking, wait, no way. There's no way he can just go off and waste everything and he doesn't have to pay anything back. He just shows up and says, I'm sorry and everything's okay now. Whatever blank you put in your mind earlier, we're holding up a mirror. Where are you at? Jesus isn't done, though, by the way. He's got something for these guys. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called over one of the servants and said, hey, what's, what's going on? And the servant says, well, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded, begged him. But he answered his father and said, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. You never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. And the dad says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
we have to celebrate things when they're found. We have to celebrate people when they're found. When Jesus is teaching this, he's trying to make a plea to everybody in the room, the entire crowd. And these guys are thinking, well, wait, we're not like them. And they're thinking, well, we certainly aren't like them. And Jesus is saying, you both got it wrong. God is a father, and the only way to get in the party is the same thing. I sometimes in my life will have a mirror up in front of me, and it's distorted. The mirror that I sometimes hold up in front of myself makes me look better than I actually am. So I walk around like I'm better than I actually am. And sometimes, this might be you, you might hold up a mirror to yourself. And you might look in the mirror and say, man, I, <laughs> there, there's no way I can live up to any kind of expectation that other people might place on me. There's no way that I can, I can come back home. Like, I like listening to Jesus, like, but I, I can't earn my way back to that. I've made too many mistakes. You don't know what I live like every single day. So it's nice to come and listen, but I know that that's not my place. And I kind of land somewhere. And here's the thing. I've been looking at this teaching of Jesus for a very long time in my life. And I'll tell you, I'm going to be really transparent and let you know exactly where I'm at right now when I look at this story. Here's kind of where I landed for me in my life. You might have a different place, but here's what I know is true for me. I am more like the younger brother than I want to believe, which ironically makes me more like the older brother than I care to admit. I I am more like the one who just takes his inheritance and runs than I want to believe. I am a sinner. I am someone who makes mistakes who pursues his own things, who does what he wants way more than I am willing to believe. And sometimes, at the same time, I am also like this older brother, believing I don't need to repent. I'm better. I'm okay. It's everybody else's thing. Wherever you land in that, just know that the same entry card to the party that the Father is throwing is the same for everybody in this room. Well, what is it? It's repentance. Both are in need of repentance. Both are in need of recognizing who the Father is and recognizing who they are. Because when you understand who God is, and his place and his light in your life, it reveals who you are as well. See, repentance requires that we acknowledge who we are in light of who he is. It means that, okay, this part of my life doesn't look like him. I I have to repent of that. Sometimes my pride can get in the way. Sometimes I think I'm better. And sometimes people show up and I roll my eyes and I think, well, there's no change for them. Or I think I have to earn my way into it. Or I think I maybe have wandered too far that he can't forgive me. And in both cases, Jesus says, repentance. Just repent. And the Father welcomes you back like a son. In either case, you're a son, you're a daughter. You're in his family. James wrote a letter to churches, and it's interesting when you think about this story when you read James, because James is also writing to a huge crowd of people. People who were Jewish, Gentile, people who were started following Jesus, people who thought they had it figured out. And in James chapter four, is just one verse, and in light of this story, it just takes a different meaning for me. He writes, come near to God. He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded people. In other words, no matter where you're at, just come. 
no matter where you're at, just know that God wants his spirit to dwell in you. He wants to throw you a party. And it's not one and done. Sometimes we're in the party and we're like, okay, and now I'm going to wander for a little bit. Or sometimes we're in the party like, okay, i got to earn my stay there. i got to go do some stuff. Nope. When we remember that the key is repentance, that Jesus already paid it all. There's nothing we can do to earn our way back. When we repent, that gives us access to the Father. And we can never stray too far. And we can never be so self-righteous that repentance isn't the key in. So I think about this in light of all the conversation we've had over the last few weeks. And I know that God wants to do something in us individually. We talked about that last week. God wants to do something in us individually. And he also wants us to do something together as the body of Christ. And I know that in either case, whatever he's calling us to, in order for us to say yes to it, it has to start and continue in repentance. Coming to him with a repentant heart, knowing that we have never fully arrived, knowing that we are not better than anybody else, knowing that we can't stray too far, knowing that we can't earn it. But staying right there in his embrace as a son as a daughter. And Jesus has already done all the work for us. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this mirror that Jesus is holding up to us today. And it's not curved. It's not squashing us or stretching us. It's exactly who we are. And we land somewhere whether we've been following you for a long time or maybe we haven't even made that decision yet, God, you show us who we are. God, for anyone in this room who has yet to just do what that son did, to understand where they're at, to come to their senses and say, I I just need to go home. God, would you enable them through your spirit to confess their sin to you, to recognize their need of you, to accept you as Lord and Savior, to follow you. That they would be welcomed home and that heaven would celebrate. God, for those of us who've been following you for a while, sometimes we stray, sometimes we take our inheritance and we run, we just do our thing and we think we have to earn our way back. God, some of us, we've been following Jesus for a while and man, we think we just, we have to stay earning it forever make us cynical. Maybe we judge others too easily. Wherever we're at, you've called us to repentance. You have called us home. God, may you do that in us, not just once, not just once a week, but every day can we wake up and surrender ourselves over to you to recognize parts of our life that do not look like you so that our reflection just be an image of Jesus to those who need to see it. It's in his name we pray. Amen.